Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. We just spoke to Rachel Botsman, the author of Who You Can Trust and a whole bunch of other awesome books, awesome TED Talk, millions of views and an all-around bloody legend. Mate, one of the top 50 thinkers as well, which is, uh, which is an impressive title to have. Now, we talked about trust and uh, one really interesting thing that I had no idea about was this new Chinese government trust rating that everyone's going to get. <laughs> so that's, uh, that was really fascinating stuff and fascinating and scary. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I thought that, that, uh, that Black Mirror episode was just going to be a you know, crock of shit. Yeah, it's just dystopian like a dystopian kind view. of nightmare. But it's actually it's, legit. It's, <laughs> it's going down <laughs> and it's coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, mate, I, I really enjoyed the chat. A whole bunch of interesting stuff that we sort of, not our usual wheelhouse, um, but really cool stuff. Yep. Rachel Botsman. Bot to the bot, bot, bot. I think a, a good place to kick it off. We've got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about. But uh, I liked your, your TED talk and that everyone's got so much stuff uh, and we're just not using it that much. And you talked about how there might be better ways of using all this stuff that we've got where, you know, maybe we can share, <laughs> share the things that we've got. Yeah. Maybe can you start off by talking about how, you know, we're addicted to having so much stuff, but it's probably not the best use of that stuff. Yeah. Um, so this was really sort of the first body of work around what we call the sharing economy. I did not give it that name, by the way. So, um, but it was based on all kinds of things and this observation that, um, all this stuff we have in our life that so we use like 80% of the time. So the stuff mm. we own, we use 80% of the time. And I started thinking about my own house um, and why that is. And do we own these things out of functionality? Is it identity? Is it impulsive purchases? And some of the stuff you couldn't share, but a lot of it has this value, this idling capacity and how technology enables us to share that and swap it and exchange it, I thought was really interesting so that's what led to the first idea yeah nice yes. i just sort of say you know we've got a, a car that we might use one hour a day or we've got a, a drill that we use once or twice a year at mm. most but we still own all this stuff and it's just sitting there um for that once or twice a year that we might use it yeah it's the funny thing so i think that was my first ted talk which was the first talk i ever did in my life by the way it was oh, really wow. quite well, nerve-wracking. Well, no, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um and um they're like Marley's ghost those talks like they follow you around and you can be in a lift and people go oh tech girl yeah. you're like no but um <laughs> and then the line everyone remembers is it's what you want is the hole not mm. the drill and yeah, so then they go drill yeah. yeah like um drill line and um so I do think it's this idea of needing the benefit of things versus physical stuff and you know we've seen this in the rise of people valuing experiences um where consumer spending is going and this whole notion of access over ownership, it's it's been there for quite a long time, like with music um, and media consumption. And if you follow, generally, if you follow what happens with media consumption, other areas of our lives tend to follow that pattern, mm. um, which is really interesting. So we've seen it in the hotel space with Airbnb and Uber and music, spot, uh, music, I guess Spotify doesn't really fit in that category, but, mm. but do you... Th- do you th- yeah, it's anymore. access, isn't yeah. it? It's not phys- it individual ownership. You're yeah. sharing it and you share your um streams and lists and oh totally so do you think we've kind of maxed out or or what or what level do you think this this can get to i mean i've got like some things hanging in the garage like a surfboard and and a lot of things just sitting there and they hardly ever get used so do you think that this is still a trend over the next say five years yeah i think though it's thinking about it beyond physical stuff so it's not surprising like houses and cars were first because they're the most expensive things that we own um i find it there's certain things also we're seeing overseas that haven't hit Australia full force. So um, in the States, subs- fashion subscription is growing exponentially. Um, so Rent the Runway is the biggest user of dry cleaning services in the United States. You think about that, wow. like yeah. compared to hotels or anything like that. So, um, But I think where it gets interesting is when you start to apply the principles uh, to non-tangible assets. So... In insurance how could you think of sharing risk in different ways um people's skills people's time people's passions um like we've seen platforms like khan academy and skillshare how will it change professional services marketplaces so i think it's there's physical stuff there's sort of monetary assets and then there's human assets and that's really interesting mm. 
And it kind of ties in very well into your next body of work, which is trust. So if we're gonna if we're gonna share something of ours with someone we don't know, mm. obviously that that's the big bridge we need to we need to jump into. So I guess if you could maybe um, roll along this segue a bit nicer than I just did just then, and you see how they tie in together. <laughs> well, do you know it, it seems I don't know about you, but whenever you look back in your life, you know you can go, oh yeah, so obvious, right? The the strands, <laughs> but it was more of a fascination like how do these ideas work uh, mm-hmm. what is the social glue of these marketplaces and that is trust and I think the interesting thing is um, you know I was involved in the very early days of venture capital around this space and investors will say well Rachel, there's a lot that can go wrong mm-hmm. with these things and strangers won't trust one another and you know blah blah car which I spoke about in another tip that's phenomenal because that yeah. is that's hitchhiking that's cool. over long long distances mm-hmm. right so um I started to become really interested in the signals you can send in the online world that, and the information people need to trust one another. Yeah. Um, and while studying that, at the same time, was just reading about like this global implosion of trust in the media and government and all kinds of institutions. And like most ideas, they have you know they start with a hunch that mm. there's something here um, <laughs> that's fun to explore. Mm. And I know like recently in Australia that the banks uh, are going through a pretty rough time because they aren't very trustworthy or have proven to be uh, untrustworthy recently and that you know, there's these big institutions that we all feel like we have to trust or we did trust perhaps in the past but that's sort of uh, dissipating a bit and you said that you know we've gone from the that's sort of the second level of trust it started locally and then it was the institutional level and now it's moving to the, the uh, distribution level yeah mm. Do you know what's really interesting though? Um, and I didn't, I didn't actually write this in the book. Um, so it's, when you look at trust in um, like overall in banks and overall in government, like plummeting, mm. if you look a next level down and you look at say trust in federal government or trust in local banks and cooperatives and new mm. forms, of, it's all increasing. And so mm. I think what it's actually tied to is not that we don't trust banks, mm. it's that the system's got too big. Mm-hmm. And when it's a scale thing, and when systems get too big, you feel powerless. So mm-hmm. it's power asymmetry, and it's also this feeling that the system just serves the system, mm-hmm. not you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that I think is that's the real issue with the banking thing is that you know I don't think the Royal Commission is going to do a lot mm-hmm. f- to restore our confidence because how do we know the system has changed? How do we know the incentives and the culture of banks has changed um yeah mm. certainly yeah and so if we were to have these big changes do we need big system changes i guess to to move in into uh, a more sharing economy or is it set up at the moment so we can go there kind of naturally if that question makes sense um <laughs> yeah i don't think it's because people go oh should we start a peer-to-peer lending platform right like that yeah. like, i don't think the sharing economy is the way to fix all these things i think there's all different ways to actually find like smallness within bigness um, and to make things feel local and like people care. And it's like what's happened with food, right? And the renaissance around local food and farmers markets. And some people talk about personalization, but I think it's deeper than that. Um, it's, it's really about empathy and integrity. Um, and so I think businesses of all shapes and sizes can do that in very different ways. Mm. And this idea of, of of trust, and you mentioned somewhere in the book that how or one of your TED talks as well, like Uber drivers, they get rated, you know, which so the, the customer can trust them. Um, I work in the buildings industry, and you know, at the moment, you could just step behind a big corporate kind of veil or a big brand, and then the individual can get away with not doing the best job. Do you think eventually we'll end up rating all kinds of the, the service economy or the service industry as well, like engineers or architects and so forth? Yeah. Um, my view, I, my views on ratings changed, have changed. <laughs> um, on the is that one, cause of black mirror? Did you watch that episode? Yeah, I do watch that. <laughs> no, stuff. no, no. And what's going on in China is very frightening. Um, where citizens will have a trust. Well, by 2020, it'll be mandatory, but, I think ratings are really interesting because we can say, oh, well, everyone gives everyone a five and, Mm. um, you know, do we really want to live in this world where we're constantly reviewing one another? But on the one hand, they 
they have an incredible impact on accountability. And you you know, the example I think you give in the book is when I send hotels, I drop my towel on the floor. I wouldn't do that in an Airbnb because mm -hmm. you do worry about your future ability to interact and transact in that marketplace. But on the other hand, like how we overcome discrimination and mm -hmm. inflation and this idea that we're continually being rated. Um, and so how, you know, trust is really, really contextual. And the problem with just being like a five or a four or is that you lose the context behind that rating. So what I hope is that not the ratings and reviews come go away, but they become far more nuanced. So it's easier to give someone an accurate rating and then you know how that person was assessed and then they're really useful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Airbnb, you can see how it's evolved now where it's uh, accuracy and communication and cleanliness and that's useful versus just one number mm. we had a we had a rating recently and this kind of fits what you're saying quite <laughs> quite nicely but someone gave us a review on itunes and they gave us three three out of five which is a poor rating for podcasts yeah. because we misspelled something in one of the descriptions and they'd never and they never listened to an episode because <laughs> it was misspelled <laughs> so that's a, yeah and it's it's really like so uh I have all five star ratings for my book, which is great, right? Yep. And then some person's given it a one and they've re re will get round to reading it one day. <laughs> you know, and you're like, what? what? No, no one reads that bit. <laughs> all they see is like there's one one, one side, and yeah. you've, you've lost, you know. Mm. And that's frustrating, oh, right? Totally. Because I think sometimes we don't think about the impact that that could have mm. on other people. And so there has to be some accountability for poor reviewing and rating behavior not just the people that we're yeah. rating but that we have some accountability <laughs> yeah. in there i agree with you <laughs> <laughs> that's that's cool what is because uh yeah we, we were talking about before this about the the black mirror episode where everyone's always rated and it's almost become gamified and everyone's mm. got the um the exterior up that they're always trying to be super nice so they don't get a bad rating because then it affects all other areas of their life uh, that's obviously a dystopian view. What do you think is the, the more realistic view of where these these ratings could come to? Yeah, no, I love that episode. I mean, I think it's so lacy, you know, how she practices a smile in the morning. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. um, I, you know, I really hope we don't head to a world like China um, where everyone is being constantly rated and it's not just the rating, it's that there's penalties attached to this, which mm. is what's so scary about that. I must admit, I haven't heard about um, this. Uh, can you give us a quick overview of the, the Chinese rating? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah so sorry. Um, so, I mean, this is George Orwell flipping in his grave. Mm. If he, so in 2014, the Chinese government um, came out with this policy statement saying that uh, most half the country don't have traditional credit scores mm -hmm. and there's really high instances of fraud and counterfeit goods and it's a low trust society beyond your extended circle so how can we fix that well by 2020 every chinese citizen will have a mandatory trust score wow. Wow. and they will have a rating up to 950 and but unlike your traditional credit score mm. um it will be influenced on different dimensions. So one will be whether you pay your bills on time, um, kind of traditional credit mm -hmm. indicators. The second will be what you actually buy. So they formed oh, all wow. these partnerships and then deemed certain things like nappies and work shoes, good uh, purchases because they mm. show you're responsible. And then like video games, lazy purchases. Wow. So your score goes up and down. That's unbelievable. Then, <laughs> yeah, and then what you say online and who yeah. your friends are could have influenced wow. your score. Oh, wow. But <laughs> what becomes weirder is if we're now connected somewhere in the online world mm. and I say something about Tiananmen Square, mm. my score down, but your score would also oh. go down. Oh, no. <laughs> and That's you can see wow. who's bringing yeah. your score down. Mm. So you can unfriend me. Yeah. And then you could also wow. see who was positively influencing your score. So you'd want to spend more time with that person. So <sighs> well, it's really they pulled everyone in by offering all these incentives these rewards and then they announced just like in that episode of black mirror that more than four and a half million chinese can't get on airplanes because their trust score is too low and their children can't go to certain schools and you can't apply for certain jobs so that's really gamified obedience 
But the thing I find really fascinating about this was when I went to China, when I spoke to Chinese people, in China, this is seen as a good thing because they've always had a system of people monitoring them and they'll describe this as more transparent. Mm. And then they'll also say, you think you're so different in the West, but all this is happening. You live in a culture of surveillance. You mm. just have no idea what's being watched and you have no control over it. You don't know what your score is. Uh. You know what your score is. <laughs> mm. I wonder who's mm. coming up with these all these rules and and or what is the highest value use of people's purchases and, and so forth. How the hell do they come up with that? I don't know. But I think, you know, I think that's what we're seeing play out with Facebook. And mm. the interesting thing about the recent crisis is, you know, it's more than 80% people say, I really care about privacy and surveillance. But people don't change their privacy settings. Mm. <laughs> the most mm. common response is to delete the app from your phone, which is actually about time and addiction, not mm-hmm. privacy. Mm. So no one really, That's, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I don't. I'm sort of like mind blown. That's pretty crazy. That um, I thought it was just you know this fantasy idea in the movie world, but it's uh, it's a real thing. It's a real <laughs> thing. And um, recently they just well they just launched two things. One, um, they have public shaming boards. Mm-hmm. So if your score this keeps getting worse. Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> like go- now when you Google it, you see and. Um, Yes, yeah, so your face is put up and it shows how your score has changed. If you jaywalk, it will mm. show you in real time and show how your score's been impacted. <laughs> I know, it might be up there all the time, right? Um, and now they've started doing random uh, voice testing. Um, so they'll just random sample people. When you go to the doctor, they'll take snippets of your voice. Mm. Well, why are they doing that? It's so they can track what you're saying it's through your phones and then what you say to people is going to become the next thing as to what you say online because I have all the voice mm. sampling. Oh, my God. This would be pretty sick, though, if you were mm. m- getting the good ratings and for whatever <laughs> reason you were, you know, a great soul and you're just <laughs> smacking it out of the park and then you just get let in everywhere for, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you get the benefits. <laughs> but <laughs> would the good souls be rewarded or would it be the ones that really know how to game the yeah, system? It's, mm. the system isn't it? it's a big game, isn't it? <laughs> um, That's crazy. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> another another one you mentioned there and we've touched on is this idea of currency. Mm. We read the book Sapiens by mm. Yuval Noah Harari and he says as we evolved, we kind of had this um, tree of life mutation in our brain where we could tell stories and this is how we evolved the species. So we tell stories about religion so we can go in big groups and mm. all that. But he said the greatest story we've ever told was this idea of money. I mean, it's like this idea of just a piece of paper, but it's this trust between two people when they pass it over that everyone believes there's a store of value here. Um, what do you think the future of, of currency is in this this story that we all believe? Is, is this story going to be strong going forward, do you think? Yeah, I love that section of the book. Mm. It, it, money is inherently based on trust like you trust Mm. that piece of paper has value it's really bizarre when Mm. you think about it right it's um and that's why i think you know people who laugh at cryptocurrencies you have to look like a currency can be anything it's just got to be a store of value that enough people believe in so when people go well what's the value in a bitcoin you're Mm. like well what was the value in a shell Mm. um so i think i think of my children so i have a four and a six-year-old I don't think they'll have bank accounts. So I think the way they think of storing value will be really different. Mm -hmm. Um, They'll think completely differently about exchanging value. So they'll, they'll, you know, I don't know about you, but those things that your parents did where you're like, really? Like, Mm, totally. They'll be like, you paid a bank or this kind of intermediary, Mm. you paid a lot to trust one another, and that will flow directly. Yeah. through the blockchain so the exchange of value um i think also a really big thing is going to be like monetization of things into micro units so even the way we're paid again the idea that you paid monthly or mm. bi-weekly because they'll get paid per task uh-huh. so it'll be like i just completed something mm. instant value mm-hmm. so i think that's like their relationship to value yeah. um will have a different time frame, be less physical, and they'll think of intermediaries in a really different way. So we're just in, in implicit in what you were saying then, we're, we're moving to a task-based economy as well. Do you see that playing out? So as in rather than at the moment, a lot of people are on salaries, but the rise of the, the freelancer, mm. do you think that's a growing kind of trend as well? Yeah, I think though um, 
people, I really hate the term gig economy, right? Because mm. I think it's very, l the precarious nature of this work is an issue because we haven't yet reimagined the social safety net. Mm. But for some people, this is A, the only option, right? And this is, they don't want to be employed by a company. But I think we're missing where this going, where it will move beyond tasks and start to take a more sophisticated form of projects where you have to figure out, you'll still have collaboration and engagement with teams and you might have like a portfolio of three or four projects. So you will still feel a sense of loyalty and all the good things that are great about a company. Yeah. Um, but it won't be like this contractual task base thing mm. that's happening on platforms right now. Yeah, that's cool. I liked in your, your book, you talked about the three levels of, uh, of trust we need. So first, uh, to paraphrase, I'm sure you do a better job, but like the, the idea itself. So perhaps uh, like a cryptocurrency as an idea overall, and then the specific institution, which may be a Bitcoin as an example, and then the individual is the third level. And you're saying that uh, something like blockchain where everybody can see what's going on uh, means that third level of trust in the individual is almost irrelevant because mm. um, there's almost this distributed trust. Um, so do you think having things like that makes it easier to move towards this type of economy or this type of lifestyle that we're talking about? And uh, perhaps to cram another question in <laughs> is like, is Bitcoin the answer or is something else going to come along that's the answer or is it just that because we've got so many cryptocurrencies, yeah. is one going to win in the end or is it just everyone's going to have a bit of everything? Yeah, so you, uh, I think you're talking about the trust stack. So yeah. trust the idea, then trust the platform and the company, and then the third is trust in the other individual. And what becomes really interesting is I think blockchain is really interesting in very low trust environments. So if you look at emerging markets where um, exchange and trade and collaboration can't happen because it's just a low trust environment, and then you're saying, well, actually, we can reduce mm -hmm. the need for trust. Um, and that's why I think people describe it as a trust machine or a trustless machine, which is bad because you still need trust, right? There's lots of things that involve trust in that. Um, I think th look, Bitcoin is just even like the first wave of cryptocurrencies. Um, the interesting thing is tokens of value um, that run on a decentralized network. And whether that is how it is today, I don't know. Hmm. Um, I also think micro units of value are going to become really interesting. So if you think of the music industry or even like let's take a book, right? So hmm. you buy a book and you have to buy the whole book and maybe you don't want the whole book. You just want the chapter on the trust stack or hmm. maybe you want to share that chapter and pass it on. Hmm. And there's going to be all really interesting ways of monetizing that value where I could put my book on the blockchain, sell individual chapters and see every time you pass that chapter on and make micro units of payment. Mm. Um, so I think it becomes really interesting in terms of attaching value to information and ideas. Well, I'm going to go off the cuff here and it's, uh, it's somewhere in the brain. <laughs> so it just, it just blurts out. It is absolutely nothing sometimes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've, I've read recently or heard off, I think it was Gary Vaynerchuk actually that the cost of attention is, is going, or the cost of advertising is going way down now mm. ad, and our attention is becoming cheaper and cheaper. But it might get to the point where we actually get um, income, we get paid small amounts by companies for giving our attention to whatever their advertisement may be. So it kind of is an extreme <laughs> version of what you're saying. And this idea of micro, this micro purchases does tie in with that quite nicely. So someone's going to pay me to watch those annoying ads exactly on right. YouTube. I love that. <laughs> like, I skip ads, skip ads, skip ads, right? It's probably lady. one of those things that, you know, it's one of those things we want to hear and it's probably a crock of shit that <laughs> no, sounds no. good. We, it spreads. I think it's, I mean, I think the reimagination of value and the reimagination of risk are like really big things that we're just starting to see. And, and things always change in a big way when like big traditional organizations lose control of the pipes. Mm like the way things flow from a producer to a consumer. And that's why I think cryptocurrencies scare the bejesus out of a lot of big companies because that's losing control over the flow of value. Yeah, fantastic. Mm. I like that. Um, we saw that you're a, 
uh, one of the top fifty thinkers on the, the it's thinkers. Such 50. a poncy title. <laughs> isn't it? Right. I didn't. I didn't even apply. Just so <laughs> um, Self-proclaimed. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> Not at the all. Oscars of management thinking. <laughs> I love how they describe it. Yeah. So I was, I was just wondering where do you. Um, yeah, how do you become such a good thinker? Where do you, where do these ideas come from? Or like, how, um, you're obviously going out and. Uh, you know these ideas you, you've talked about the collaborative consumption you've talked about trust um, what, are the, what what are you thinking about at the moment um, well so I'll try not to both at the same time like the ideas come from actually from stillness I think I have to work and as as your ideas get more popular it becomes harder but how you really bank bank bake stillness into your life and these periods of like intense curiosity and intensely unpacking something. So to a point where you really don't understand it and you hate it and you're confused and, Mm -hmm. and it's about taking very complex things and lots of strands of things and reducing it to something very simple. Um, Mm. That's, that's the DNA of my work. And I think the thing I've come to understand is so the first incarnation of what you think the idea is is generally not (laughs) that's not the thing and it takes time so you know the what there was seven years between the two books which is quite a long well I had two children in between they they (laughs) were books in themselves but um I do generally think like otherwise you're just writing the chapter of the last book um and so it starts as questions and it starts like because I read a lot like you go so it's like I can't find anything on this Um, so at the moment I've started to read a lot about alternative realities Um, so virtual realities digital doppelgangers and I think there's something really interesting in this question of what it means to be human Mm. and that perhaps all the rising fear around AI and ethics and is this meta question of well, the digital version of ourselves, mm-hmm. not robots, but the digital version of people become more trustworthy and better than the real human. Um, so that's how things start. And then you just, you, you know, it's like follow just, it. you just follow it and you look mm-hmm. and you listen, and you tune in and you go and you listen to people you disagree with and the friction and the friction and the doubt and the uncertainty is where the idea really forms. Yeah, Fantastic. Right. Right. And with that, is that, with that stillness, do you, is that meditation or how do you get that stillness? Because uh, I've seen a, a lot and I've been there as well where you just think you're so bloody busy and you're walking around and, you, you know, you don't have any second in the day and you're just <laughs> doing the, the rub of <laughs> the lips Do and that again, that was off- getting in the <laughs> <laughs> Be like a horse carrying a phone, walking around the office with a suitcase doing, you know. So yeah. it's this idea of just being busy and it's uh, a lot of people I feel like are proud of Oh my own, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How are you? Busy. Like, it's, you know, it's like, oh, I'm so busy. Um, I think it's a combination of, like, you can't be too precious about it, right? So, and this especially happens when you have kids, because I used to wake up, it's not meditation to answer you, yeah. I used to wake up and I used to write from six to 10, and that's gone, right? Like, that's, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Um, it's about, so there's small daily habits where you, um, so wherever I can, I listen to podcasts um, about things that I would never read or pick up in the newspaper. Um, I am like religious about a book that I'm going to read on a plane or a whole pack of articles. Mm. And it's it's like anything. You've got to make it a habit. You've got to make this practice habit. So I think there's daily things that you're doing, the way you take notes, the way you, you're actually documenting what you're seeing. Mm. Um and then I think there's, so I've been on the road a lot and I've got this new course designed for Oxford and it's not done. Um, <laughs> and um, so I just wrote to Phoebe, who I work with, and I was like, right, there's two weeks, nothing comes on the calendar, nothing. Hmm. It's blocked. It's like, there's nothing. And it's really got to be life or death hmm. or something to do with the kids or something that is so time sensitive hmm. yeah. and you have to protect it. Um, Mm. like gold you really do and I think this is a lot of things don't happen because we are very bad at saying no and we don't think about priorities and so we get drawn into things that other people want you to do and then you have nothing to show for it Mm. nice I like it we begin our our slow arc 
around towards the end. We normally ask, um, what are your favorite books? Uh, but we also oh. want to sort of include favorite books or what, what podcasts you listen to, what, what other thinkers uh, do you like mm. uh, checking out? Yeah. Um, so books, um, I um, am a massive fan of Michael Lewis. Mm-hmm. Um, he's written a whole range of mm-hmm. books. Um, so w- when you start writing, because people say, oh, how do you write, right? And it's like, it is a muscle. And one of the things I found is like, Michael Lewis has unbelievable cadence. In his mm-hmm. Have you read his books like Flash Boys, Smartest yeah, Guy in the Room? Big Short. Big Short, right, exactly. Very complex things that should be boring, right? Flash trading is not yeah. an exciting, <laughs> and he yeah. does it. And it's all in the cadence of his writing. And if you read it and you listen to it, you start to pick up on that cadence. So one of the things I say to writers is like, hear a ca- not the language, the cadence, find a writer that really can influence you there. Um, I am listening at the moment to Adam Grant's podcast. Oh, yeah, nice. Work Life. Um, I like... Also, I think uh, Thinkers 50... Or, uh, I think he's number six, actually. Yeah, he's he's, he's, yeah. he's way up there. <laughs> Adam is really unique in that he is a very traditional academic mm. at Wharton and then he is very careful with his language. Um, mm. So he doesn't over-intellectualize anything. It's very human language mm. that is quite sticky um, and I think that's – he's very good with his framing around mm. things. Um yeah. And I like his books less, but you have to give Simon Sinek credit for doing that as well. Like he's mm. very good from the stage. Um, I I'm trying, there's books that I've read that I love. Um, so I just read a whole series of books on sort of the crisis in the states. So um, Janesville, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this book, brilliant yeah, book. Um, it she went to live in the first town where the GM factory closed. First year, in fact, and she mm. documented the impact on these, mm. you know, fourth, fifth generation factory workers on their lives. Um, and it's an amazing, amazing piece of writing. And then there's another book called Hillbilly Elegy. Have you heard of that by yeah, Janie Vance? And that. his is a story of how he got out. Um, oh, okay. And he's now like this, he went to Yale and he's this very successful lawyer. But he, it's not a book about hope, it's a book about the need to see someone or something that shows you a way through. So we talk about education, but it's actually, there is no alternative story. Mm. Um, And it's one person for him that shows him Mm. potential. Um, Phenomenal. Yeah. Fantastic. As we, uh, as we wrap it up and if people want to find out more about yourself and your books, where should they all go? Um, well, my website's rachelbotsman.com and I put all my articles and things on there. And then um, I'm most active on Twitter. So that is my social channel of choice. Yeah. Um, I just like it. I like it for sharing deeper things and then daily things that you're seeing. So, yeah. yeah nice. And the only other question we always ask is sort of what, what are you working on at the moment? What are the next projects coming up? Um, so I'm working on this new course on trust in the digital age uh it's just actually gonna be very fun it's like yeah. trust it's a bit Yuval Harari and there's trust from the beginning of time um all the way through to blockchain and ethics and stuff so cool. I'm gonna go that um I'm actually moving back to the UK no oh. uh, yes I am that's a big mistake mm. <laughs> <laughs> no sorry is it? No, so I've been here 10 years <laughs> so and then um I'm working on a, it's not a podcast series. I'm thinking about audio books in a different way. So That's how can fantastic. you, what's between an audio book and a podcast? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm playing around with some of those formats as well. Awesome. Mm-hmm. I love it. Well, thanks so much. Pleasure. It's <laughs> lovely to be here.